Good morning, everyone. Well, let's all stand. We're going to sing our praise song this morning.
good morning everybody and welcome to Riverview Baptist Church. We're so glad that you came to worship the Lord with us and I welcome you that are online listening to us also. I'll go over some of the announcements uh, today. Prayer meeting and Bible study will be Wednesday at 7 and uh, we're going through the Bible still and, and seeing how it all interconnects. Women's exercise Thursday at 6 at the Fellowship Hall. And praise team practice at thir- Thursday at 6.45. Young adult small groups, April 8 at 6 at the pastor's home. Dinner and child care are provided. And deacons meeting and Bible study, April 10th at 8.30. And fellowship meal is April 10th at 6.30. And there's be a sign-up sheet in the vestibule for that. Pitt County Relay for Life is April 12th at South Central High School. And the South Roanoke Baptist Association April Gathering will be April 15th at 6.30 at Redemption Church, New Hope in Wilson. Uh, we'll have another game night on April 26th at 6. That's always fun. Come out and enjoy that. And the food roundup for a Baptist Children's Home will take place during April. And there's a display in the vestibule about that. Okay, so please participate in the uh, food roundup for the children's home. Um, also, uh, you know, we've installed the playground equipment back here in the back. The uh, fence was installed this week, and there'll be a, a grand opening next Sunday directly after church. And please join us uh, to dedicate and pray over it, and lunch will be included. And please sign up to help with food in the vestibule. Does anybody want to elaborate on that any? Okay. <laughs> All right. On behalf of the children's department, come out and in, enjoy uh, that event. It should be uh, fun to uh, to bless this uh, playground equipment and uh, watch the children use it in the future. Any other announcements? Well, let's turn to our prayer list. Then, do we have any additions to our prayer list today? Okay, Katrina's a little under the weather, so, so remember her. Anybody else? Uh, praise God. Uh, I had been, I had been a problem this week with my arm because I pulled a couple of muscles in it. Uh huh. And I went to the doctor, and they put me on some medicine, and thank God it's getting much better. Okay, yeah, praise the Lord that Shirley's uh, arm is much better today. So remember Shirley Jones and Frank Coburn and uh, Stella Singleton in your prayers. Okay, Nancy Hollis has had surgery and and be going to Ridgewood for rehab, so remember her in your prayers. Anybody else? Bill, um, I start a vision Friday for my inventory that is is something we've been working on for a while, so it's kind of a closed item, but still a little little nervous about it, so it's okay to continue to remember. Okay, remember Rhonda in your prayers. Anybody else? Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, we come to you today just thanking you so much for being there for us. It's, it's good to be in your house today to, to study your word and, and uh, 
listen listen to uh, how it all connects and fits in our, our lives, dear Lord. I do want to lift up the ones who are sick, and there are several mentioned this morning. I know you've heard those names, and just ask that you would to minister to their every need, dear Lord, and help them to recover from their illnesses, dear Lord. And I do want to lift up families that have lost loved ones recently and just ask that you be sending your comforter to them, dear Lord. I do want to pray for our country again and ask that you would help us as we go through this political season that we could get through this and, and elect the leaders that will do the best for our country. I do pray for the areas in the, the world that are suffering through some, some wars, dear Lord, and uh, just ask that you would help those come to an end that no one else has to die, dear Lord. I do want to ask that you would be um, among us today as we listen to your word and help us to get a blessing from it, dear Lord. And I just ask that you would be with us when we leave this place and, and just help us to be a shining example to everybody that we come in contact with that they can see you through us. These things I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. If you all have your copy of God's Word, I invite you to join me in the book of First Peter this morning. First Peter, where we will study together the first nine verses of chapter one. 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 1, we'll read together through verse 9. And as you find that, and as you're able, uh, please stand as we read God's Word together this morning. 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning this morning in verse 1, this is the Word of the Lord. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, and the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ, and for sprinkling with his blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Pray with me and remain standing as we continue to worship through song this morning. Father, as those who have prayed before us, uh, we also pray this morning that what we don't know, you would teach us, what we don't have, you would give us, and what we are not, you would make us. For Christ's sake, we pray. Amen. Love's 
Peace of mind, the answer true, merits my soul best songs. Faithful, loving service to, to him belongs. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me, love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. Souls in danger, look above, Jesus completely saves. He will lift you by his love out of the angry waves. He's the master of the sea, builds his will obey. He, your Savior, wants to be be saved today. Love lifted me, love lifted me, when nothing else could help. Love lifted me, love lifted me, love lifted me, when nothing else could help. Love lifted me. you have your Bibles, I invite you to join me back in 1 Peter, uh, chapter 1, as we consider together those verses that we read just a moment ago under the heading of salvation now or later. So we're going to obviously this morning talk about salvation. Uh, it's a good thing to do in church uh, in case you all had forgotten or had never heard that or, or heard the phrase. Uh, and this morning we're looking at a text where it seems that salvation occurs at, at many different points over the, the Christian life, over the Christian walk. And so I very cleverly titled the sermon this morning, Salvation Now or Later. Y'all remember those little candies? The, the, I think they're now and laters. I, I thought about bringing those in to give one of them to each of you all, but three things. One, I thought it might overshadow uh, the sermon, and we certainly wouldn't want to do that. Two, I don't go to Walmart under any circumstance whatsoever. Uh, and three, those things are gross. Uh, they are not good. Little plastic pieces of candy. Uh, y'all go buy yourselves the Snickers or something this afternoon and just pretend. Uh, so this morning, we're, we're going to consider salvation. What does it mean for the believer to be saved? It's something that we should be calling others to. Uh, it's something that we should be calling ourselves to. And by the way, I'm going to draw attention to this red cup right here. It's tea. Uh, it's triage this morning. Uh, I'm recovering from some kind of something. So if you see me stop and do this, like this, it's so that I can carry on. We hear expressions in our, our world today like, man, you need Jesus. Uh, oftentimes said when someone has done something that we consider to be so egregious that they need Jesus. Uh, or, or we hear people say things like, well, I found Jesus. Uh, and, and, and theologically, by the way, uh, that is not entirely an accurate statement. Uh, a better statement, so if you ever hear anybody say, I found Jesus, correct them gently, lovingly, with patience and understanding. Uh, Jesus found you. Uh, that's what the Bible teaches, right? The Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Not the lost went seeking for the Son of Man. The Son of Man is the one doing the seeking and the saving. As Christians, as believers, salvation really is the cornerstone of our relationship with God. It should inform how we live our lives and it should lead us to, if you have your Bibles, we're jumping down uh, to verse 8. This is spoilers, all right? Our salvation should lead us to rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. That's, that's, that's the, the result of our salvation. And by the way, that, that's, a, that's a present reality. That, that inexpressible joy should be the mark of the believer here and now and in the age to come, right? So I've, I've given you all a trick question, by the way. Salvation now or later, well, it's both. Uh, and Peter's going to show us that as we walk through our text 
this morning, where we see the, the big idea of these nine verses that we're considering together this morning is this, our present and future salvation gives us believers the ability to experience inexpressible joy. Our present and future salvation gives us as believers the ability to experience inexpressible joy. How, how many of you all can picture in your mind inexpressible joy? All right, so like when, when I think of inexpressible joy, the first place I'm going to is like Christmas morning, you know? The, the kids are barreling up the hallway uh, because they know there's something good at the end of that hallway. And so the, the question that each of us needs to face this morning is, uh, does your salvation metaphorically make you want to barrel up the hallway because you know there's something good at the end of that hallway? That's where our salvation should lead us, to this inexpressible joy. Now, we, we need this morning to define, I'm going to define three words, four words actually, that we're going to, going to utilize throughout our sermon. The first is joy, right? We oftentimes confuse joy and, and happiness. Uh, and these two things are, are not the same, though they are, of course, related. Happiness is, is a, a temporal feeling that is predicated on the circumstances around you, right? If I have an ice cream cone in that moment, I'm more likely to be happy than if I didn't have an ice cream cone. But my joy is not dependent upon whether or not I presently have an ice cream. Joy, uh, according to the Bible, this is a, a, a biblical definition, uh, is a feeling, in the, a good feeling in the soul, in the heart, produced by the Holy Spirit as He causes us to see the beauty of Christ. Uh, that's what joy is. It's this, this wonderful feeling within the soul produced within each of us by the Holy Spirit as we see Christ in his beauty. And, and note that the Bible never tells us your joy is predicated on your situation. In, in fact, Peter's going to say, rejoice despite your situation. Paul again and again and again tells us, rejoice despite whatever's going on in your life. Why can we as believers do that? Because we understand salvation. And there's three words related to salvation that we have to define uh, together before we walk into this text. They're big words. We're, we're using big words this morning. And so if you need to, to write these down afterwards, you can just ask. I'll show you my notes. The first word is justification. All right. This is the, the moment of initial salvation for the Christian. So when we come to Christ, Paul says, Romans chapter 10, confessing Jesus is Lord, believing in our hearts, God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That moment in the life of the believer is the moment of justification. Definition for that word is the act of God declaring or making us righteous. That's what it means. God makes us righteous, and he does that as we come to him in faith. And Peter's going to highlight that for us when we get uh, down into verse 5 this morning. That, that's the moment of salvation. That's the, we, we could call it this morning the moment of conversion. We could call it the, the first moment that you're a Christian. And, and from that moment of justification, God looking at us and declaring us righteous because of our faith in Christ, for the rest of our lives, we're walking through a process called sanctification. Sanctification. This is simply the process by which someone is made holy. The process by which someone is made holy. We, we say it a little more colloquial, colloquially. That one got away from me this morning. Uh, in here, uh, we simply say we want our lives to look more like Jesus and less like ourselves. That's the process of sanctification. It's the process of us being made holy. It's the process of us being made more like Jesus, which, by the way, necessarily means that we become less like ourselves. So from the moment of salvation, from the moment God declares us justified, righteous, saved, for the rest of our lives, we're experiencing that process of sanctification, being made holy, being made more like Jesus. The, the third aspect of salvation is one that we have not yet experienced. It's called glorification. 
glorification. This is the, the final removal of sin from God's people when we dwell with him eternally. All right? So we have justification, the point in which we are saved. We have sanctification, the, the process by which we are made holy. And we're looking forward to glorification when God removes sin from his people as they dwell with him eternally. Those are the, the processes of salvation. So is it now or later? Well, yes. And, by the way, it's past, but I couldn't fit that in there. Now and later is very clever. Uh, you can't say past now and later. That doesn't make sense. Past, present, and future, uh, no, we don't want that. Now and later, it's very, you all have to appreciate that with me this morning. Uh, I'm going to make you if you don't. And so, what does it mean for us to be saved? Well, it means that we walk through those steps. God declares us righteous. We live in obedience because of his righteous declaration. And then we ultimately will experience the removal of sin when we dwell with him in his eternal kingdom. You say, you got all that from that text that we read just a moment ago? Uh, I sure did. I'm going to show you all where it is. Uh, We're going to walk through these verses together as we see our present and future salvation which produces within us the ability to have inexpressible joy. Begin with me in verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Uh, so we're going to like stop right there. That's, that's as far as we're making it uh, before we have some comments this morning. Uh, here we're seeing the author. So New Testament letters begin uh, the opposite way that we begin, right? If you write in a letter, you're going to write it how? Dear such and such. And that such and such is the recipient of the letter. Then you write whatever you have to say. At the end, you put yours truly, sincerely, love, whatever, and then your name, right? Well, New Testament does that exactly backwards. Uh, So they take their name and put it up front. That way, uh, you don't have to uh, figure it out. If someone just handed you a letter, right, no envelope, what's the first thing you're going to do? Well, open it up and look at the bottom and see who it's from. Well, the New Testament writers just tell us right at the front. It's a much easier way for us to do things. And so we see here Peter. An apostle of Jesus Christ. That word apostle there means a a sent one, a messenger of Jesus Christ. Now, we have studied together uh, several of the Gospels, and we've seen Peter uh, again and again and again uh, make really what I've uh, often called boneheaded decisions, right? Peter's the kind of guy who speaks before he thinks. Uh, Peter's the kind of guy who uh, doesn't have a filter, we could say this morning. Uh, And Peter's also a a guy who knows some stuff about sin. But Peter's also the one that Jesus looked at and said, you're Peter, the rock. You're the one on whom I'm going to build my church. Now, we're just coming through Easter, right? So when we think about Peter and we think about Easter, uh, what's the, the first thing that really comes to mind? Well, his denial, right? So we Jesus declared Peter to be the rock. Before Peter got to that point, Peter became the denier. Jesus said, you you all know, Peter, you're going to deny me three times before the rooster crows. That's the same Peter who wrote this letter. What happened? Well, Peter denied Jesus three times before the rooster crowed. And then uh, when Jesus was raised from the dead, what does Jesus do? Well, he asked Peter three times, Peter, do you love me? And Peter, of course, all three times says, I do. Uh, And Jesus says, okay, you, Peter, go and live the rest of your life encouraging your brothers, loving your brothers. And how does he do that? Well, in part, he he writes a letter, two letters, actually, 1 Peter, and then very cleverly titled afterwards, 2 Peter. He writes these letters to encourage the brothers and sisters For all time, so from like 60 A.D. when he wrote this letter until now, Peter has been living out that command that Jesus gave him, encourage your brothers. And that's what he does. He he writes this letter. He says, originally, to those who are the elect exiles of the dispersion in these places, Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, uh, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. So he's writing this letter, and he addresses it to this group of people that he calls the elect exiles of the dispersion. Uh, That's simply a way of saying the chosen people who are cast out of their homes in the dispersion all throughout the earth. Originally, he he wrote to the people in in these, uh, what is it, five areas, 
right? So if you have a, a Bible with a map in the back, you can go and you can flip to it. It's going to be one of the New Testament ones kind of closer to the back. Uh, and, and you'll see this area is like modern-day Turkey. So Peter's writing to this group of people who had been cast out of their, their town, cast out of their homeland, uh, and they had been sent off into these areas. And his entire goal in writing to them is to encourage them, hey, you all are exiled right now, and Jesus still loves you. And you still have a, a basis for hope. And you still have a salvation you still have uh, the ability to encourage one another. And so he writes them a letter. And more than them, he, he writes us this morning a letter. Uh, the New Testament's very clear. This world is not our home. You may have lived in your house for 50 years, 60 years, 70 years. The New Testament still says, this is not your home. We, as, as believers, are uh, experiencing a time of exile. As we live in this world, we are to be aliens, sojourners, foreigners. We live our lives in exile because we, as Abraham, are longing for our final home. We're longing for the place where we will dwell with God forever. And so Peter writes this letter to encourage us. And in verse 2, he gives us the, the pattern of the Christian life. He, he gives us four little uh, partial phrases. He says, first, you're, you're elect exiles according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with His blood. So this is the pattern. He, he says, you are elect exiles. You are chosen exiles. And we, we, we this morning would just say believers, Christians. People who have placed their faith and their trust in Jesus. That's who Peter's writing to. So if that's you this morning, this is for you. This is the pattern of how you became a believer. First, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Peter here is simply saying, God, before time began, declared that all Christians would become like Christ. Uh, it just means God, before Genesis 1-1, so right, remember that one in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Before that moment, God looked forward and declared, Christians will be like Jesus. So how does that happen? Well, Peter tells us in the next few verses. In the sanctification of the Spirit. Number two, for obedience to Jesus Christ. And number three, for sprinkling with his blood. And so he says, believer, you're in exile, and God knew that. He knew where you would be. And so what does he desire for us to do? Well, he desires for us to see these three ways of us becoming like Jesus. First, in the sanctification of the Spirit. You'll notice, by the way, that's present tense. In the sanctification of the Spirit. That means, believer, wherever you are today, here and now, you are to become more like Jesus. You are to walk through that process of being made holy, of, of, of becoming set apart. It's the gradual progress of the Christian life. How many of you are, are perfect? How many of you all have made it? Are anybody brave enough to raise their hand? No? Good. And that's what the Bible says. This is a gradual process over the course of your life. And so as we grow in holiness, as we learn what Jesus wants us to do, what's the, the second step for obedience to Jesus Christ? Now, if we didn't know, if we weren't growing in sanctification, if we weren't growing through the Spirit, we wouldn't know what Jesus wants us to do. Really, we could, could like big picture summarize this, by the way. For obedience to Jesus Christ is God's purpose for the Christian life. You say, what does God want me to do? He wants you to be obedient to Jesus Christ. Uh, so anybody who asks me that going forward, what, what's God's will for me in this situation? This is going to be my answer. Be obedient to Jesus. We, we have a saying in our house. <clears throat> if you ask Thomas Baker, what is obedience? He'll say, obedience is the first time, every time, with a happy heart. Uh, and that's really what the Bible teaches us. If we are to be obedient to Jesus, we have to listen the first time, every time, and do so with a happy heart. Now, by way of disclaimer, just because he knows what obedience is does not mean he understands what obedience is, right? Though 
just this morning, he was having a fit about something. I don't even know. I said, Thomas Baker, what is obedience? The first time, every time, with a happy heart, (laughs) as he stomped his way to his timeout chair. (laughs) And really, if we're honest, as we follow after Jesus, that's us most of the time. All right, first time, every time, happy heart. Now I'm going to go over here and do what I want to do, Jesus, and we'll talk later. And we see, finally, third, uh, for sprinkling with his blood. And this refers to the means by which the first two were accomplished, right? So Jesus, we, we just celebrated Easter, right? We, we, we celebrate Easter, Jesus' resurrection, because we're able to celebrate Good Friday, where Jesus shed his blood for each of us. Uh, and, and Peter says, if you want to be sanctified by the Spirit, if you want to have the ability to be obedient to Jesus Christ, then you first must be washed with his blood. He's taken us all the way back to Exodus here, Exodus 34, when God sets up a, a covenant with the people of Israel. Uh, and, and Moses has just come down with the, the two tablets, uh, and God is creating a covenant. They, they uh, put a lamb to death. Moses dips his hand in the blood of the lamb and sprinkles it on the people uh, and says, you are now clean. Uh, and that's foreshadowing, of course, the, the greater lamb whose blood leads us into a greater cleanness. So that's how we're saved, by the blood of Jesus and by no, no way else. It says, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. That's the goal of his letter. I want you to be filled with God's grace and filled with God's peace. And and notice, by the way, he doesn't say, I want them to be added to you. He says, I want them to be multiplied to you. May they be ever increased to you. And so beginning in verse 3, Peter bursts into praise. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, he, he thinks about what God has done. He, he looks back. God, from eternity past, has designed to save a people for himself. He has designed to cause that people to grow in holiness, to grow in obedience, to be cleansed by the blood of Christ. And where does that lead him? To praise. Praise be God. Blessed be God. Look at what he's done for us. And then he shifts gears to begin to talk about salvation. And what Peter's going to say is God has brought salvation now. And God has guaranteed it into eternity. And and I I use those words very intentionally. God has brought salvation now. And God has guaranteed it into eternity. Look at the phrasing Peter uses in verse 3. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading kept in heaven for you. Did you catch that? According to his great mercy. Go back up to verse 3 with me. This is the means of salvation. This is what Peter's saying. You are saved as an act of mercy. You are saved because God looked down upon man and loved them enough to send his son as the ultimate act of mercy. This means that we should understand we bring nothing to the table when it comes to salvation. We can't give, we can't work, we can't do anything except come to Christ. We're, 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 we're beggars in need of mercy. We have nothing. And it's exactly that that God has given us. He's given us mercy. Paul in Ephesians chapter 2 says we're saved by, by grace through faith. It's, it's an act of mercy. And, and some people have, have come and read the New Testament as a whole and, and, and places like here and, and accused God basically of unfairness, right? Well, well God, why, why, why are some people saved and some people not? Why are, why are some people walking with you and some people aren't? Well, we're going to get to that in just a minute. It's through faith. But really... If we think about it as believers, the, the, the struggle we have shouldn't be why are some saved and not others, but why are any saved at all? Do you remember who you were before Christ? Do you remember who you were apart from Christ? The Bible tells us, and, and we're getting ready to study together Romans, uh, it's not a pretty picture. We're self-centered, self-serving, self-exalting people. The Bible says we're dead in our trespasses and sins. The Bible says we're openly rebellious against God. The Bible says we wanted nothing to do with God. 
And what does the Bible also say? According to his great mercy, he came to us. You see, God doesn't leave us where we are. He sends his son into the world to seek and to save the lost. The miracle is that there's any salvation at all. If you all look into your own life before Christ, would you have saved you? That's the depths of God's mercy. Despite you, he sent his son Jesus. That's why we read in places like Romans, but God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were openly rebellious, Christ died for us. While we were exalting ourselves, Christ died for us. That's God's mercy. And look what he says. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again. I I, I like the song we just sang uh, because of the tense of the words used. Uh, And it's part of the reason I like 1 Peter here, verse 3. He has caused us to be born again. Who did the acting? Well, God did. In the song we just sang, the, the, the implication is we're drowning. And what happens? Well, God lifts us up. Love lifted me. Not I treaded water to the very top and then the rescue boat came. No, God reached down and picked us up. And and that's what we see here. We see God's work in the salvation process. He has caused us to be born again. Well, what did we do? Nothing. And that's the point. Nothing we did merited God sending Jesus. It's love, it's mercy, it's grace. He has caused us to be born again. He gave us new life. Friends, we are passive in this process. Now, we have a, we have a, we have a night to play, and I'll show you when we get there. But the main merits of our salvation is on Christ alone. We do nothing. And, and that's what Peter here is, is, is showing us. God is the one who has caused us to be born again. And what are we given? Well, we're given new life. I, I, I think back here <clears throat> to John chapter 3, where Nicodemus comes to Jesus and asks him this question. I'm paraphrasing here. Jesus, what do I need to do to see God? Well, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What does Jesus say? You must be born again. And what's Peter here showing us? God is the one who causes that new birth. That's what Jesus says in John chapter 3. But not only are we born again, look what we're born again to. We're given new life. Ephesians 2, I'm, I'm going back to it. It says, we were dead in our trespasses and sins. And God has caused us to be born again. To what? To a living hope to a living hope. Uh, There's a modern song now that sings about how our our hope springs eternal. And and the picture here is of of an eternal spring of water welling up. And and that's the, the picture here of a living hope. We have a living hope because Jesus is alive. We just celebrated this together. We have a living hope because Jesus rose from the dead on the third day. Our hope is not in a tomb somewhere. Our hope is on a throne. We're born again to that living hope, which is Christ. And how are we done? How how is that accomplished? It says, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The new birth is possible only through the resurrection. And this is why we celebrate Easter. But really, if we're we're Christians, if we're believers, every day should be Easter. It, it, It doesn't here say, celebrate the resurrection one day a year. No, this is a present tense. We, we have that living hope every moment, of every day of our lives. That living hope is not something that comes around once a year. Living hope is something that goes with us no matter where we are. So God looks at, at, at believers, <clears throat> not as themselves, 
but as Christ. And this is something Paul elaborates on in Romans. And we're getting ready to study the book of Romans together. Uh, And effectively what he says is because of the resurrection, we have the ability to become united with Christ in his resurrection. This is why we celebrate baptism, right? So baptism is a symbol, an outward sign of an inward change. What's the change? Well, we have died with Christ We've been raised with Him as well. We're now united with Christ. And it's that unification that's brought with us new life, a living hope. And that's the present. And verse 4 shows us the future. Because of God's mercy, God has caused us to be born again. Because of God's mercy, God has guaranteed for us, look here, an inheritance. Now, what is an inheritance? If you all think about an inheritance, what is it? Something given from a, a, a parental figure to a child. It's not something earned. It's something given. And that's what we see here. Not only are we born again, but we're born again into God's family. He has given us an inheritance. He's given us that land that we we saw as we studied together Genesis. And not only has He given us an inheritance, look at the description of the inheritance. That is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. Nothing can tarnish, nothing can extinguish the inheritance. This means, by the way, uh, that nothing can take it away from us. Nothing can cause it to go away. And, And Peter elaborates on that. Look, look at the end there, verse 4. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you. And notice again, who's doing the keeping? It's not us. It's not kept in heaven by you. It's not kept in heaven by your good works. It's not kept in heaven by your obedience. It's kept in heaven for you. The implication is someone else is keeping your inheritance. Someone else is watching over it for you. Jesus in John chapter 6 says it a little bit differently, but it comes to the same point. He has just described himself as the the bread of life there and says, and all who come to me will live forever. Then what does he say? The Father places them into my hands, and I will not lose a single one of them. Friends, listen here. If it was up to us to hold our salvation... We all would have lost it. What does the New Testament say? It's not up to you. It's up to God. That goes all the way back to His mercy. His mercy was there when we came to faith in Him. His mercy will be there when we see Him face to face. And His mercy is with us every step in between. It's kept for us. Jesus is the one who is holding it here. And so in verse 5, he's going to shift back to the present reality of the believer. We've seen the past. We've seen the justification. We've seen the future when we will be glorified, the glorification. And so in verse 5, he's going to shift back to the present, the, the process of sanctification. And so the subject here is us still. God is the one who has caused us to be born again. What does that mean? That means we are saved. It means we will be saved. What does it mean right now? Look at verse 5 who by God's power are being guarded. Notice the present tense. This is now, here, even as we sit and gather together in this room, God's power is guarding us through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in last time. In the last time. So, what's guarding us? Did you catch that? God's power. That's the present reality of the believer every day of your life. If you wake up, God's power is with you, guarding you, keeping you, protecting you. What are we being guarded for? A salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. And so then what are we to do? I I told you all, we have a part to play. So Peter here is magnifying God. He's showing us God is the one who is doing the work. God is the one who is moving the mountains. God is the one who is extending the mercy. God is the one who is causing us to be born again. But we, the believer, that's us, plural, have a role to play as well. Did you catch it? 
two words in the very middle of verse 5 there. How are we being guarded? Well, we're being guarded by God's power through faith. There's us, right? So we've been passive in most of these verses. God has caused us to be born again. God has kept us, <clears throat> God has kept our inheritance in heaven. God is guarding us by his power. Well, here we become active. How are we guarded? Through faith. What are we to do? Have faith. Trust. How does the New Testament define faith for us? Well, Hebrews chapter 11 is pretty clear. It's the assurance of things hoped for and the certainty of things not seen. And, and we're going to see that when we get down just a minute into verses 8 and 9. That's, that's what we are to do. We are to be assured God is guarding you. We are to be assured God has caused you to be born again. And we are to be assured God is preparing a place for you. And that's what Jesus says. If I go away, I'm going to prepare a place and I'm going to come back and I'm going to get you. And so in verse 6, we shift again to, to the present reality of our circumstances. So, so 3 to 5 is showing us our salvation. It's showing the basis that we have for our joy. And verse 6 is going to elaborate on what we are to do as we live. In this, we rejoice. What's this? Well, it's our salvation. It's everything he's been talking about in verses 3 to 5. Though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. And so many of us, uh, show of hands, how many of y'all have had a trial at some point in the past, I don't know, 72 hours? Past week? Past month? Right? Most of us. Uh, so Peter here says, though now for a little while. Uh, and whenever we read this, most of us are thinking, man, all right, how long? Uh, 80 years on average, right? It's all the days of our lives. That's a little while. And, and so why does he call that a little while? You know, when I think a little while, you know, God, give me a trial for a weekend. Actually, you know, Tuesday, Wednesday is probably better so I can enjoy my weekend. But, you know, just a, a couple days here and there. Uh, but Peter says, no, for a little while, and he's implying all the days of our life. Well, Peter's looking forward, right? How long is 80 years compared to eternity with Christ? Drops in a bucket. A little while. He says, if necessary, uh, and it is, uh, this if here is not, uh, maybe, it might be necessary, uh, but Peter gives us this if, and, and there's a big fancy term we're not going to go into. Basically, this if is assuming that we agree positively. And as believers, we should, right? If necessary, and it is, you have been grieved by various trials. Uh, and, and, and you, on the kind of surface level, of course, wouldn't agree with that. God, I, I don't want trials. You know, teach me the easy way, God. Um, but as Christians, we're, we're never promised an easy life, are we? Any of you all ever have somebody tell you following Jesus is easy, you need to ask that person, are, they, are you sure you're following Jesus? Um, what does Jesus say? If you want to follow me, you do what? Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. He says, in this world you will have tribulation. He also says, take heart, because I have overcome the world, and that's why we can have joy in the midst of the trials. But here, Peter says, you've been grieved by various trials. We're not promised an easy life. As a matter of fact, we're promised difficulty, pain, suffering. These kinds of things are God's will for our lives. And, and I think the reason becomes abundantly clear uh, when we look at it from God's perspective. How many of you all learn the easy way? <clears throat> Somebody just tells you what to do and most of the time you listen? No, those people are like one in a million, right? So mom says, you know, I did this this way. Don't do this. What's daughter going to do? 99 times out of 100, that. Right? Dad says, son, I learned this lesson the hard way. Be very careful when you find yourself in these circumstances. Son finds himself in these circumstances. What's son going to do? 99 times out of 100. Learn the hard way. Make the same mistakes. Friends, we learn through difficulty. Because most of us are hard-headed and it takes difficulty to get it to that space between our ears where our thinker is. 
These things are promised for the believer. You've been grieved by various trials so that, look at verse 7, the trials have a purpose. This is called a purpose of result. The thing that we have just seen will lead us to the thing we're getting ready to see. It's a transition phrase. We have trials so that. So if you ever wondered why is everything so hard, I'm getting ready to tell you. Well, Peter is, and I'm just going to read what he says. So that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. We, we can take out that middle phrase right there and still understand what he's saying. So that the tested genuineness of your faith may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. We get trials for a reason. What's that reason? To cause us to grow in sanctification. To cause us to understand what it means to be made holy. Most of us learn the hard way through trials, and that's what Peter's saying. You're, you're learning the hard way so that the tested genuineness of your faith. And he calls that the most precious thing we possess, by the way. Uh, that's what he says. Your faith is more precious than gold that perishes, even though your faith is tested by fire. You see, most of us, when we come to these trials, don't pray, God, burn me up right? Make the trial a little bit hotter, God. Take away the impurities. Now, most of us say, God, take this trial away from me. God, make it easier again. Uh -uh. God here says, it's through the trials that your life might be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. This is the goal of the Christian life, for us to be faithful in the midst of the trials for us to be faithful in the midst of the difficulties so that our lives might be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. That is the moment of glorification when Jesus comes back again, when he removes sin from the world and from his people. Peter says in that moment, because of your trials, your life will have the ability to result in praise and glory and honor at at the revelation. Verse 8 and 9, and we close. <clears throat> he, he, he says, not only, uh, by the way, uh, is your life to praise and glory and honor Jesus at the revelation in the last days, at the last time. Uh, he shifts in verse 8 back to the here and now. Certainly, in the end, also in the present. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible. And filled with glory. That's what the Christian life should look like. You've gone through trials? Well, rejoice with inexpressible joy. Because God is doing a mighty work in your life. He says, though you haven't seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him. This takes us back to John chapter 20 where Jesus has uh, just revealed himself to Thomas, the, the doubter. Uh, I think we said last week we're supposed to call him Thomas the Believer. Uh, and so we're going to call him this week Thomas the Believer has just placed his hands in the, the, the nail print and placed his hand in the side of Jesus. Jesus has said, all right, blessed are you, you have seen. But guess what? Those who have not seen receive a greater blessing. And that's what Peter here is saying. You haven't seen Jesus, but you believe in him. And so what's the blessing? The ability to rejoice with joy that is inexpressible. Y'all know what that is? It's becoming so overwhelmed by God's love and God's mercy that you can't even express what he's done in your life. This is an act of mercy. This is an act of grace. This is an act of love. It does our life reflect that inexpressible joy? You're here this morning, you're a believer. Uh, that's what Jesus wants you to, to contemplate. Am I able to rejoice with joy? We see verse 9, the, the outcome of our faith. It says, though you don't see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. This is part of the reason we 
titled the sermon, Now or Later. It's both. And that's what Peter here is saying. There is going to come a time where we will see the outcome of our faith, where we will see the salvation of our souls. The implication is, well, if we're believers, aren't we presently saved? And of course we are. But Peter here is encouraging us as we live our lives. As we obtain through trials, through difficulties, through the fire, the outcome of our faith, the salvation of our souls. So if you're a believer here this morning, that's your end goal, to to dwell eternally with Jesus. But before we get there, we have the day in and the day out process of being made holy. And if you're here this morning and you're not a believer, you never placed your faith and your trust in Jesus, then that's where you have to begin. Through faith in Him who can cause you to be born again. Wherever you are, I'm going to pray over us and we're going to sing together a final hymn of decision. And I pray that you would use this time to, to ask God to teach you, to show you, to reveal Himself to you. God, am I able to say with 100% certainty, I am walking with inexpressible joy as a believer? And if the answer is yes, then praise Him. And if not, ask him to help you in whatever circumstance you find yourself in. Wherever you are, I'm going to pray over us. We're going to sing a final hymn of decision. If you will, stand with me as you're able. And Father, we are so thankful for your word. For the present and future reality of our salvation. We're especially thankful for your mercy, which has enabled us to come to faith in you. And so, Father, I pray for each individual here that you would send your spirit uh, to lead and to guide, to encourage where encouragement is needed, to correct where correction is needed, to light the way uh, where a light is needed. Father, wherever we are, I pray that you would meet us there and be with us as we respond. We ask in Christ's name. Amen. decisions or testimonies that need to be made this morning. If not, Lee, would you close us with a word of prayer?